Well, hi again, everybody, and welcome to another special edition of COSA TV. I'm Greg Blanchard, and uh, we want to congratulate the 2021 inductees into the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. What a star-studded group it is, including uh, Jim Bullock in the builders category. Jim, of course, the uh, proprietor of the famed uh, Glengate Farms and a, a member of several industry organizations over uh, his outstanding career. He and wife, Pat, uh, really an immense contribution to the sport. Congratulations to Jim, uh, the outstanding broodmare, great memories, uh, producer of four sub-150 winners in her illustrious career as a broodmare and uh, a pair of millionaire performers as well. And the gentleman that's joining us uh, tonight as our special guest, uh, I'm in my home location here in London. Uh, he's in Rockwood uh, coming to us remotely, uh, just a sign of the times, but uh, we're certainly glad to have him. And we want to congratulate uh, driver Randy Waples. Thank you, uh, Randy, for joining us. Uh, now, Hall of Famer Randy Waples, how does that sound? It sounds awesome there. It's just um, it's just kind of tough to wrap my head around it, but it, it does sound it sounds really nice. And thanks for saying that. <laughs> well, really quite an honor and achievement, uh, Randy. So tell us, how do you go about uh, finding out that you've been inducted into the Hall of Fame? Um, well, um, a, a lady named Linda Rainey called me and told me that I was uh, that I got through the nomination and I was nominated to be elected into to inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, and then uh, I was sure she told me that they were going to um, meet on April the 15th to the 16th to, uh, dis you know, to vote and to see who was going to go in. So I, I kind of just like put it out of my head. And then in the Monday, uh, the, whichever Monday it was, I got a phone call from Greg Porchak. And um, uh, I, so I called him back. And again, I wasn't thinking of that because it was like maybe like the 10th or something like that. So I didn't think that they'd voted on it yet. I thought it was just an interview about COVID and then uh, like us not racing the shutdown. And so when I started talking to him, the, the first five, six minutes was all about, you know, the COVID and what's going on and that. So again, it was completely out of my mind. I just never put it together. And then... Um, about halfway through the conversation, he said, uh, he said, oh, he says, by the way, he said, I'm not just calling about the COVID. And I'm like, oh, okay, what else? And then that's when he told me. So again, it was like another surprise. It was surprise number two or number three or whatever it was. I wasn't expecting it again any, at that point anyway. So it was a, I didn't sleep Monday night. That's when the, the, the phone call came was Monday night because I didn't sleep. And I went right to Chantel's Tuesday and I was there about 5.30 usually, 5.30, quarter to six, and, and I worked. And then I figured by Tuesday I'd be able to sleep, but nah, nah, the sleep wasn't coming Tuesday either, not very much. There was like maybe about two hours of dozing off. And then by Wednesday I was able to put my head down and go to sleep, so. It took a while to kind of wrap my little head around it. Well, Randy, uh, you know, things didn't come, uh, in terms of success, didn't come immediately for you uh, as you look back. Uh, you were almost 30 years old when things really started to pick up steam and, and start to get rolling for you. Uh, when you think back now, can you um, recall a point in time that, that you would say was the real turning point for you? Well, the, the huge turning point was, was um, walking into Fred Hoffman's barn broke. I mean, it's not usually the best way to go get a, you know, to, 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 to show up, but that's basically what I did. I had 10% left of a horse that I was still training that I owned, and I just could not afford to pay him the training bill. So I went to Fred's barn. He's, he was really good with fillies, and, and he was always, like, really good with me. We weren't, like, real close or anything, but we always talked on the track and that. So I asked him if he would mind taking the filly, and I would come in twice a week and work off my 10%, and he said he would. And then it just started to happen. And that's basically what it was. I can tell you one of the first horses that I drove for him that kind of got me rolling with him, I guess, was a filly called First Dawn. And I'll always remember that there. She, uh, she, she won me a bunch of races on the B tracks. And when he brought her back over to Woodbine, she kept winning for me. And, and uh, she really, I would say First Dawn really got me going. She was the first horse I drove for Fred. And, and then there was a whole bunch more and then F Fred, all of a sudden, then it was Stu Lot and Real Bourgeois, and then Kevin McMaster, and Doug Berkeley and Bill Robinson, and then just all started happening. 
So Randy, as you uh, reflect back at the beginning of your racing career and, and having the last name Waples, I mean, uh, it's instantly recognizable when it comes to Canadian harness racing and synonymous with success at the highest level. Having that last name, I mean, when you look back at it now, was that a negative or a positive or maybe even a little bit of both? I think I did more damage to the Waples name than the Waples name ever did to me. I can tell you that. Um, I don't remember. I don't. Re I don't ever remember Keith or my dad saying hi to a lot of vagina. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> um, no, like I mean, it, it, it. You know something? It's it's like a two-edged sword. It really is. Like I mean, you come in there and 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 if you're 18 years old and you start driving, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to be compared to other 18 year old drivers. That didn't work for me. I mean, from the minute that I sat in a race bike, I was compared to my father. And at that time, he would have probably been right around 39, 40 years of age. So I mean, right in the prime of his driving career. And, you know, that was a little frustrating, you know what I mean? Being compared to him at that such an early age. Like, I mean, I didn't know I still don't know half of what he knows, and at that time, I didn't know a you know I didn't know a thimbleful of what the man knows on the track, you know. So that was a little bit tough, but you know, it, it is a name that opens doors. It makes people look at you twice sometimes, and and you know maybe that kind of helped. Maybe that's what kept me kind of going. Is every once in a while people would throw me a bone or something because of my last name. I, I'm I'm really not sure about that, but it, it worked good in a lot of ways, but it also was a little bit of a detriment in some ways too. It's hard to, it's hard to be son of trigger sometimes. So as we said earlier, uh, you know, you were close to 30 years old where uh, things really started to take off and you had that, uh, I think, breakthrough moment in your career. Uh, when you look back now, why do you think it was that it took you a little bit longer um, than some others to hit your best ride? Um, well, I mean, if you really look at it, like, I mean, so anyway, I start driving, so I'm, I think it was around the winter of 84, and I know Steve would be about, probably about nine years younger than me, so if I was 18 at that time, Steve Condren would have been 27. I'm going to put Brownie at maybe two years older than Steve. Um, so that would put him at about 30, 31. Like, I mean, these guys were all in their prime. And I'm 18 years old wanting to be the next Ronnie Waples or the, you know, whatever. Like it just, you had to wait your turn. It's as simple as that. You know, you had a lot of great drivers around there then. You had, you know, like those two that I just mentioned, you had Dave Wall, you know, you had Harold Stead, Tom Strauss, uh, Garth Gordon, you had uh, Reg Gassian, um, Bill Gale had come in when Greenwood was just closing up or whatever. Like these guys were tough to to, to want to get drives and you know, these guys were the best at their craft up here. And you had to basically wait your turn or find something else to do. So I kind of found something else to do. I dabbled a little bit in the acting and that and always kept my finger here. And, and then, you know, like I said, it just, um, I just fell into the Hoffman thing. I, it was just luck. I guess like you could really say that that's more or less what my whole career has been. It's just been lucky. Very, very lucky. Lucky for the, for, for the situations that I've, I fell into and, and extremely, really lucky for the people that I've dealt with. That's the most amazing thing about the whole career is that I've just been very, very lucky with the people that I have dealt with over my career. I, I can't say a bad word about anybody. Well, your career is uh, chock full of outstanding seasons and of course uh, many big wins and, and many great moments, but really everything seemed to come together for you in 2001, uh, a year you could do no wrong, uh, career best in terms of wins, uh, I believe 550 victories for you that year, uh, well over $10 million in purses. Can you take us back to that year and uh, you know just kind of recall uh, how things went so right for you and, and came together so perfectly that year? Um, well, it was just an unbelievable year. Um, I can't give enough credit to Bill Robinson's barn and everybody that I was driving for then, whether it was Bill. Kevin McMaster was hugely dominant at the time. I was driving for the leading owner on the circuit, Burt Smith, and I mean, he was, anybody knows Burt, 
put his uh, stable name as almost doesn't count and that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted wins and he was more than willing to claim a horse for 20 and put him in for 18 the next week just to be able to race the horse and when you're driving his horses it's pretty nice to get a nice 20 then for 18. So it just it was just one of those fluky years there that everything seemed to roll along good. I was healthy and and never you know pretty well injury free the whole year so it was just one of those years with so much power and being healthy in that that I was just able to put up some real serious numbers. Well switching gears a little bit Randy uh, of course uh, and, and you've always been very um, I think candid about this in your career that hey you're only as good as the horses you're driving uh, and in your case uh, you've had the pleasure to sit behind some really great equine athletes but I think the one that comes to mind immediately for most people is uh, the great sand pail. Uh, take us back to uh, the early days of getting associated with the horse and, and Rod Hughes and when you started to realize you had something special. 